Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have David Richards. Hello. Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. Eric Berry. Hey. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And uh, this week we're talking to, let's see if I can do this, something close to, to good, Pavel Dabrowski. Yeah, hello, it's great, yeah. <laughs> now, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Yeah, sure. So my name is Pavel. Uh, I am a Ruby developer from eight years over. Uh, I'm a part of the Ironing team. It's a Polish company. We work remotely. And I think you may know me from my blog. I started it in January. Uh, actually, it was a part of the New Year rev- resolution. So it's all about building a personal brand as a Ruby developer. And I think uh, this is the best introduction for me. Awesome. Now, I ran across your Build Your Own RSpec article. And it was mostly an example in metaprogramming, but it was still kind of interesting just to see how far you can get on instance eval and things like that. So, yeah, do you want to just kind of give us a quick rundown of the article, why you wrote it, and what it's about, and we can dive in from there? Yeah, sure. So the article simply explains how you can build your own R spec. It's a really simple version, but I was curious just how they build it because I was using it this for years. So I decided to dive in and just to share my thoughts and some easy way to, to reproduce the, the simple features of this. And it was really fun to do this. And I think uh, most people like this. Very cool. So I, I'm, I'm especially excited about the topic that we're talking about today. Um, the uh, branding and how you've utilized Ruby in your self-branding thing. So I'd, I'd like to know, like, first off, why do you think it's important to brand yourself? And maybe we should actually take a step forward to that. And what does it actually mean to brand yourself? Well, for me, it's important because for all my career, I was working on the commercial projects and I don't really have uh, any proof of my skills. So I decide to to share my to share my skills, to help other and build something that will tell other people what I can do, right? Even if I don't want to leave my current company, it's always worth to, to build something like this or especially help others on the Stack Overflow or GitHub. So do you think a lot, so a lot of people probably run into that, right? Where they have so many of their, um, what they work on hidden behind private uh, private accounts. And you know now that there's a way, and I think um, people complain to GitHub about this, but there's a way for you to now allow people to see that you are actually having activity on private repos, even though you can actually see what you're doing. So at least those little green boxes continue to be green. Yeah, I think it's great, but it's, it's just a personal thing. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, that's right. You know, I've got green box envy. I, uh, <laughs> a lot of my commits, they go to GitLab instead of GitHub. And so even in private repos, people don't realize. So it looks like I had done nothing for about 18 months. <laughs> and you're in, no, I make commits every single day, I promise. <laughs> and there's some scripts out there that you can have just uh, 
kind of fool the Git history, and it'll actually make a little ASCII picture on your um, Git history chart. It's kind of cool, but, you know, kind of weird and pointless, but. I like it because it makes it personal, you know, showing our work and, and hey, this is me. You know, I, I slave away out of my laptop all the time, but, you know, pay attention. I, I'm a real human over here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to get lost in the, in the shuffle or easy to just to do my own little thing and not, and not show my work. <clears throat> so you said you started the blog, too. So I'm wondering, you know, with the, the green boxes and then the blog. Um, what what prompted you to want to write a blog as opposed to contributing to gems and other things that add to the community in other ways? Well, so it's important to contribute because doing that, we are helping other companies, right? Because most of the companies are using open source now. So it's the easiest way to, to be part of it. And it really helped us grow just as a human and developer. We all like free stuff, but it's also important to create free stuff to, to share with other <laughs> in any form. Yeah. You know, and for me, sometimes it's documentation for what's just up in my head that I'm not going to remember tomorrow. So whether it's setting up my own development environment or whatever, you know, I've written blog posts on just how to do that. And I will go back and refer to it if I get a new computer or something, just because I don't want to have to memorize everything. I want a resource where I know that this works for me. This is how I like it and something I can refer back to. Yes, exactly. Many, many people say that they want to write a blog because they can write and this is not unique. But the fact is that each of us is unique and his own voice and ways of doing such stuff. And we should just share it. And because of that, we're always learning because uh, we are doing something twice. And sometimes it shows that we were wrong and we just have to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. differently it's hard but it's always help us grow as a developer yeah i found that's that's good developer therapy for me just writing the documents or writing out a blog post after i did something it just helps me calm down and like okay yep this is <laughs> it, it, it it can rest a little easier in me you know either i i refine it a little bit better or or let it go and and i'm not always quite as uptight all the time I do that. Yeah, and to Dave's point, I'm, I'm probably going to forget this later. Um, I I will sometimes write the blog post, and then a lot of times I'll look at it and say, and then can I make this into a script so that I don't even have to remember the steps, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you find yourself going back to your blog posts and solving your own problems down the road that you might have forgotten? Uh, yes, once or twice. Yeah, it helps me. I've, I've had the experience of uh, searching for a problem and then I find it on Google and I finally find the solution and it's a link to a post that I wrote back in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, huh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you, Eric, but I was smarter back then. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was smarter back then. <laughs> now that's the beauty of these blog posts. And, and I lo I'm looking at your blog post right now, just so that everybody knows the, the URL. It's pdabrowski.com slash blog. And you have a ton of content. You've just been writing for a long time and covering topics from Active Record to refactoring to Ruby on Rails, and especially lately the posts on RSpec. Now, let me ask you this. Why did you decide to rewrite or create your own version of RSpec? What was your goal in doing that? Well, I was just curious how, to, how they created it. Because when you look at it, it seems to be very hard. But it's just a Ruby, right? So if you are the Ruby developer, you are able to create such tool. And this is great in Ruby. It may seem to be hard, but in Ruby, it's, it's very beautiful code. And it's not that hard to rewrite it. So I just wanted to share with other people. Yeah, it looked pretty simple in the blog post. I, I guess my question is, is how deep do you get before it really does start to get hard or messy? 
uh, well, <clears throat> it's what it was hard for me to to reproduce the R spec code. So I just look into it, then I look into the documentation on Ruby and just takes the easy way to achieve this. Mm -hmm. So I just stop on the single feature because it would get messy anyway. So <laughs> I just stop at this. Yeah. But, but it's interesting that I, I, cause I've heard that from two other people that have written their own testing uh, frameworks and they've said, yeah, it's just Ruby. Like, yeah, to me, it's magical. So I, I guess going through the process <laughs> of uh, writing your testing environment and actually getting what, what it does probably cleans that out so that you, you realize it's not magical. It is just Ruby. Yeah, right. And thanks to this, I just realized that many of the gems that I write think with the DSL are just a Ruby code, right? So we can just reproduce their architecture and there is no magic into all those config files with the blocks. So it's really fun to, to use this daily now in other projects. So uh, did you have DD to build your testing suite? <laughs> 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 what, what was the question? Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. Did I, I didn't hear DD to build the testing, uh, yeah. testing gym? <laughs> No, no, I don't use it because it was really hard. So yeah, I just, I just need to be honest with you. I, I didn't do it this way. <laughs> so having done this, when you're writing regular application code, do you feel like you, you think about the application code a little bit differently now that you've gotten a little tighter with testing? Yes, of course. I think it's much easier now. Maybe even I don't use it daily, I always feel like, okay, I'm able to do this if it's required. It's not magic for me now. It's just a matter of skills and Ruby knowledge. I, I don't know if this is my number one problem in life, but it's got to be my top 10. You know, when I have something I, I want to do and I'm a little bit afraid and I avoid it and I avoid it and I don't realize how long I'm avoiding it, like test-driven development or really learning how that DSL works or, you know, just those things that, that they seem hard. And so I avoid them, you know, I can always make myself busy <laughs> and never get around to it. And, and yet, it, you know, just if I did what you do, I'd probably be a happier person because just getting in and figuring out how, to, how it works is probably what I should be doing a little bit more often. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. I was holding this back for a whole year and I just decided at the beginning of the year to just try this finally because this is the, the best time to do this. If not now, then never. <laughs> well, and I, I like what you said too, that, you know, just having dug through that, if you reproduce the same architecture, you could have the same results. You know, it's just, it just takes away all the magic of it. It's like, oh yeah, I see how they, how they organize it, how they were thinking, just do more of these things. And now, I have everything I'd want. Well, and I think yeah. I think a lot of this is it's interesting because people complain on at least in the circles that I move in, you know, people complain about the magic in Rails or the magic in uh the DSLs around things like R spec. And the reality is is, you know, you you demonstrated in a blog post that really wasn't that long that it's not all that magical and what we get out of it is something that is really easy to approach. Yes, in my other blog posts, I write about less known rise features. And there is also magic. And I was trying to explain that it's not magic at all, but it's hide from us, right? right? So it's not that easy to find the code in project, but it really happened in code, right? But in Rails gem, not in our project. But it's still Ruby. And still many people just are afraid of it. Yeah. How hard was it to get into blog writing? And how important do you think that is as a developer? Well, it was hard because I was afraid of the other people's opinion. You know, it's, a, it's about leaving your comfort zone and something like this. You're always thinking that your writing skills are not enough. So I finally started and I think it changed the way I look at code and at my developer career. 
and I highly recommend for everyone in Ruby to start their blog just to document uh, their skills, to share uh, opinions, to, to improve their skills, right? Because um, it, writing your own blog is one of the best ways to confirm your skills, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, can, you, you should just put your skills and then ask people what they are thinking about it. It might be wrong, it might be okay, but there is always more growth behind it. Are there channels or tips that you can give new authors to be able to get those blog posts out there in front of other developers? Yes, I think the most important is consequence. I started to write posts daily, but I stopped it after three months and I started to write longer posts once a week in what in, in which the best idea. And I think just they shouldn't be afraid about other opinion. We should just share our words in our unique way. And I think this is the best advice. We just guess have to start, right? And then everything will come next automatically. Right. I love that. I I've I tend to be a little scaredy cat some days. I, I get, <laughs> I'm afraid sometimes a lot of, you know, I I write bugs instead of code sometimes and everything seems to go wrong. And I'm always afraid that something's going to go wrong and just getting in and doing it. Um, I had that fear of writing and I started writing every day just for that same reason. I don't want to, I don't want to hold back. It's easy to, <laughs> it's easy for me as a software developer, as a usually pretty inter introverted kind of a personality to, um, to not exercise the rest of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, very excited with your your example here yeah and also i think it's okay to fail because my first posts were terrible just zero visits and then i came to idea to share my articles on reddit or rubyflow uh, to gain more visits and i just improve myself with every article i write i change my blog dems to to gain more visits. Now I'm rewriting the whole blog in Ruby because it should be obvious that I'm a Ruby developer and I should have my blog in Ruby, not PHP, but it was faster. I just wanted to start and then just change everything on fly, you know, because the most important thing is just to start. No excuses, just, just work every day. I yeah. like it. One thing that Man, I'm curious about with with the blogging is you've got this blog post that's essentially on metaprogramming where you're talking about how to build your own RSpec, but then you've got a whole bunch of posts on RSpec. And so I'm wondering if one, uh, I guess I'm going to ask about inspiration for the blog, right? So do you find that you're um, more inspired or did, did one set of blog posts inspire the other? Uh, sometimes, yes, of course. But sometimes I'm just creating my own code and then I decide just to, to share it because I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And it would help me if I would not know about it. And I just put it on my blog and, and see the results. When you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks and VPNs. Plus they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code RubyRogues2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is RubyRogues2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com careers to see their available positions. 
I found that when I was blogging a long, long time ago and did it fairly regularly, I had the same mentality that you did. In fact, that's kind of what led Chuck and I to the paths that we found is um, our desire to share information mm-hmm. um, through through uh, teachmethecode.com long, long, long ago. Um, but I found that every single time you write up a blog post to explain something or you create a tutorial video or screencast to explain something, you always get better the next time around and you get better and better and better. And I don't know many writers that are better than, than my good buddy here, David, David Richards. And um, <laughs> what, what do you think about that, David? I mean, you've written so many blog posts and so many articles on, on, on different topics. Um, yeah, I, I mean... It definitely takes this passion, um, but I wrote a really terrible blog article last night, <laughs> like a bad one, and I put it out there. Nobody cared, and I thought about that, and then I realized, ah, oh, I, I forgot the fundamentals. You know that if if it's timely, interesting, and relevant, you know it's it's going to treat somebody like they're at least as smart as me or smarter, and I just need to point their their, their, their attention in a direction where, um, it's useful to them, you know, so it's really easy. Like we, we've gone to school for all these years and, and we always learn all these little elements about things we're supposed to know. And we're always getting ready to get ready. But I think that, that really engaging with somebody involves giving them the stuff that empowers them to really go for it. And, and do something like write your own R spec, you know, do something great and get in the middle of the thing you're afraid of and start doing it. Because until we have that confident practice, until we actually feel like, oh, this is me, then we're always feeling like we're trying to catch up. And I found that sometimes in some harder areas of my technical um, career, I've always, I spent years getting ready to get ready. And, and so I don't know that, that level of engagement. So that, you know, it's a wake up for me to just, oh yeah, you know, these are very smart people that are very busy. So empower them to do great things and, and trust that they'll do it. You know, they, they can, we can start them in the middle or start them at the top and then fill in the details later if we have to, but um, get people moving. Cause there's so much, there's so much to learn. <laughs> And and the other thing that came up for me, um, I'm kind of wandering a little bit in my thoughts, but this has been something I've been really, uh, I went to bed thinking about it about one or two o'clock in the morning this morning. And I got up early around 5.30 this morning thinking about the same stuff, you know, and it's just this idea that, that education isn't the acquisition of knowledge. It's the practice that we want. We want to assimilate it. And, and use it and actually engage differently in our lives. It's not just putting facts in our head, but actually like, you know, like we're getting with this RSpec and all these great blog articles we're reading today. You know, it's like, yeah, do it, do, do something good because that's what real education is about. So yes, good stuff. Yeah, I totally agree with the David. And I think if we want to get different results, we just have to do different things. And it's always scary in our minds but it shows that it's not that scary at all. It's just a matter of start. And, you know, I was wondering always how to get into Ruby weekly. It's not possible for me because I'm not at the same level as other people, but it was easy. It's just a matter of writing a good article and sharing it. And then it, it comes to you suddenly. Yeah, whenever one of my articles appear in Ruby Weekly, even today, I'm so like, oh, cool. You know, Peter, you know, got that in there. You know, it's uh, it's a small sense of accomplishment. It's really cool. Well, and I think I, I think some people look at this too, and they they don't realize that if you're if you want to be in Ruby Weekly, it. I mean, sometimes yeah, you you write an article, maybe you share it on Ruby Flow or Reddit, and you know, Peter finds it. But I've, I've had a few things that I know were interesting to the Ruby community at large, like when we had uh, David uh, DHH on the show. Um, I just emailed Peter and said, hey, this is what we're doing. This is when it's coming out. And uh, I found that a lot of times he's open to that too. If, if you have something that you know is going to kind of hit the spot that they want to hit with Ruby Weekly, you know, you put something up there and a lot of times they'll put it in because you know, it is the kind of thing that people are looking for. Plus, anytime you get DHH talking about Bitcoin, it draws attention. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you've you've had a lot of experience um with uh moving from and this is based on the notes that i've read about you but you've had a lot of experience of moving and helping people move from a junior programmer up and somebody getting into programming uh can you talk about that experience talk about like how hard it is to find a job talk about what somebody can do to help build their own personal identity and their own personal brand in order to become more marketable as a developer? Well, it's really hard to get the first job because uh, many people think that they have to find the, the best position at the first place, but it's really important to just start. You can just join a small company, I did, and then you can just move forward, find another company is, if this previous is not good for you. And if you want to join some kind of company, you just have to show some experience. So it's a good idea to put some code on the GitHub or create your personal project. And I think people are afraid of this because they might think they are not good enough and somebody can just criticize their code. But it's not true. You just have to start and then show your work. And programming... Uh, Environment is really friendly environment, and I'm sure that many people are ready to help you just move forward to the another level of being a developer, Ruby or any other programming language. And I think this is the same thing with the personal brand. You just have to start and don't be afraid to show who you are and what skills do you have. You are not going to be perfect because perfect is stagnation. You just have to be you, and then each day be better just by practicing or writing uh, articles. I used to wake up on 4 a.m. just to learn new things or uh, do more more code and it, it changed my life because I was always doing the extra stuff. I was proactive and it's important in the junior job and any other level, senior or medium. So how how important do you think it is for, first off, how important do you think it is for the GitHub profile uh, to be filled up, kind of show activity in that? And if it is important, how does one go about showing activity, um, showing that they are working and coding and, and that stuff? Well, I think it's more important than resume because it's a practical thing. You, you don't depend only on letters, on titles, or experience on paper. You can mm -hmm. just show your work and give a proof of your skills that you are good at this position. And I think it's really important. So like show of work, like, like open source, like contributing to open source, releasing gems, is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, yes. But I think at the beginning of the of their path, I think it's important to just commit your projects. Uh, I'm sure it's too difficult to contribute to the gems at the beginning, so it's okay to, to put your own code, private projects, even simple. I think that's enough uh, for the start and it will be okay. One thing that I've seen though is that a lot of times um, potential employers will go to GitHub and look at somebody's projects, but they don't really know where to look to evaluate whether or not the person that they're looking at knows what they need them to know. And a lot of times they're also pressed for time and there's a lot on GitHub. So is there a way to make your GitHub profile easier to approach? Oh, that's the hard question because most of the, uh, the people not technical are not familiarized with the mm -hmm. GitHub. But I think it's important to to just show up to do something, right? Even if there is not enough code on the GitHub, it's always good to have something. It's better yeah. than blank. Yeah. If the CEO is technical, it will it will find the proper code, but it's just a big picture of you and we should do our best. I think there is no practical thing that might help 
That's yeah, cool. I, I, I've done a few things that uh, that I think help in that regard. One is is if you can, especially if you're sending them like a PDF resume or something, you can put links in there. So you can put links to uh, commits or pull requests that are, you know, that have that particular thing in there. So you can say, I implemented this blah, blah, blah in my project. And then you link to the pull request or things like that. It just makes it really easy for people to approach. Um, the other thing is, is you can also set up a resume or a start here repo and then do the same kind of thing. If you're looking for these kinds of skills here, here's where I've demonstrated that. Yeah, I think that's the great way because we should not count on luck, just show people what we want to show. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. You know, this conversation is reminding me of something I found last week. Uh, in Portland, they had a conference. It was a Write the Docs conference. And um, somebody had been a, a junior developer and she um, went to this conference, got herself there, um, and got involved in these projects. And they made, I think she said she made 32 commits in two or three days, um, you know, and able to really get into the community just by writing the docs, you know, finding areas where the documentation is out of date or missing, mm -hmm. filling it in. And then that meant that they also went in, read the source code, and figured out how the, how the projects were meant to work. And so it's a way to, I think, ease into, you know, if you're, if you're going to start making Git, GitHub commits, that's one way to do it. In fact, they have websites and things, write the docs, but, but just that idea of, yeah, well, I, I don't know if I'm ready to <laughs> send a pull request into to Ruby and, <laughs> and change the core of Ruby somehow, right? Or try to get them, but I could write a document that makes something more clear, or I can, something yeah. I used or a question that I didn't that I had to look up that should have been in the docs. I can, I can add a quick pull request for that and, and make the world a little better place, you know, in, in smaller steps. Well, in that activity, uh, you know, the green squares that we were talking about earlier, I mean, if people see that you're at least active, I mean, that, that counts for a lot. You're at least yeah. doing something every day. Yeah. You know, I, that's gotta be a, a big part of it too. As a hiring manager, I want to know that the person I want to know that they're reasonably talented and that they have interest in what we're doing, but I also want to know that they, you know, they, they like doing work, that they do things, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's easy to burn out or, or to get discombobulated and, and, and not, not try something. And so it's just seeing those little green squares. So yeah, okay, well, they're, they're active, they're involved. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what all the greens are for, but they're, they're doing things. So that's, that's, that builds confidence in me. Well, especially for those companies where they're, they, they kind of need somebody to get in and do some work. Like, so, so I talk to a lot of companies that are hiring and they basically say, we need senior people and we can't find them. Right. And eventually what happens is a lot of these companies will get to the point where they, they, they have to hire somebody, right. They, they have to start making more forward progress than they're making. And so then what it comes down to is, is this person somebody that I can bring in and get up to speed quickly, even if they're not quote unquote, a senior person, right? And that's what those green squares tell me is that they are working on something every day. They're out there learning stuff every day. And, and that's, that's a big payoff there is because then you can look at it and you can say, well, you know, I'm just going to give them more stuff to put green squares on. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, I also agree. It's always something, right? But I think there is always problem that the people in the human resources sections uh, are not familiar with the old places where yeah. developer can be active, right? Many of them knew GitHub, but less of them knew Stack Overflow or even try to find the blog of the candidate if he have one. So it's, I think it's still a problem that non-technical people try to recruit the technical people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> you have an article in your uh, company blog that talks about automation using Hubot. 
That was very interesting to me. I recently went to a uh, the GitHub uh, Universe conference last year, and they talked a lot about it, but I've never seen anybody actually use it in a, um, I've never seen it actually used before. So can you talk a little bit about that, about how um, Iron Ironin uses Hubot for your, for, for your needs? Yeah, sure. So we are working on Slack daily as a team communication. And we had this problem that we, when we need to deploy something, there is not always someone who can do this. So just to speed up things and make it easier, the, the company decided to automate this. And now it's, it's very easy. You just have to type two commands in your chat and, and it's done. The servers are deployed and everything is restarted. You can also merge your commits or revert them uh, and do such amazing stuff. I really love this and it really helps team to grow because even non-technical persons can, people can just do this easily. It reduces cost and time and I recommend it to every company. Love it. Yep, absolutely. I have preached on this show about automation, so I'll, I'll refrain, but it it's absolutely, yeah, it's a time saver and a consistency maker and all of the things that save the company money, but also save everybody headaches. Yes, yes. There are small things, but really important. It's a fun thing, but when I joined my company, I was the only employee and there are like 30 employees now and the automatization really help us to grow. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's really important to speed up things and help in grow at all. So I'm kind of curious, what are you working on now? You know, are there, are there other areas that you're looking to learn for the blog or um, as you're in your role at the company or anything like that? Uh, well, currently I, I'm writing my own blog engine in Ruby. Yeah, I already shared some articles about it. Uh, about code syntax hi highlighting. I'm also in the Ruby gems right now. Uh, I thought it was hard, like the RSpec architecture, but it's really easy. And I have a lot of fun because of sharing my code as a gems. And I think uh, some people like it, but it's really hard to, to maintain many gems because it's time consuming all those pull requests or issues. So I think for now I will stop at four gems and I will just keep going with my blog and write better articles. I also plan to, to record screencasts, but the future will show. Just on a side note, how much do you think um, funding would help you uh, as, a, as a, an open source developer, an open source maintainer, where does funding, like, would that actually motivate you to work more on those projects? Yes, yes, of course. But there is a always limited amount of time. So right. I just have to use it wisely. Yeah, I would love to work on the open source for all my time, but it's not possible right now. I get it's it. a great, great experience. I really recommend it to everyone to try just very cool. Very, very cool. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into picks then. For you, the listeners of Ruby Rogues, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at lootcrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf. Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Eric, do you want to start us off with picks? Yeah, I got, um, I think I'm just going to share one today. And it's something that I've been pretty excited about. Uh, I found out, uh, uh, so I've been kind of avoiding front-end frameworks because they come and go. 
And oftentimes when you get in, it's like such a commitment. It's like getting married. And if you marry the wrong person, like I did the first go around, then you end up with a lot of trouble down the road, right? So <laughs> I've been very wary. But one of the really cool uh, uh, front end tools there are is Vue. And I think a lot of us have heard of Vue. It's similar to React, but it's, it's a little bit more easy to grok in your head. The part that I love is that Vue itself doesn't solve all the problems that I want, but there's something called Nuxt.js, N-U-X-T-J-S.org. Now, what Nuxt does is it takes all of the Vue libraries and makes it super simple to create front-end applications that allows us to um, not have to think too much, right? And that's, that's what all of us want to do. Like, we want to build great stuff without having to think too hard. At least that's how I am. So I highly recommend checking out nuxtjs.org. Uh, pretty freaking cool. Nice. Yeah, we talked briefly about Nuxt.js on the third episode of Views on View. So if you're interested in that, it was kind of a beginner's take. We didn't go too deep into it. But, uh, we also have a View podcast. So if you're interested in that, go check it out at viewsonview.com. Uh, Dave, what are your picks? Yeah, I have two picks, uh, both power tool related or pneumatic air tool related. Uh, I got a this retractable air hose thing that I mounted in my garage. So this weekend I ran a line from my basement. I have a 20 gallon compressor down there. So it's nice padded quiet down there. But then up in the rest of the house, I want to be able to use my air tool. So I ran a hose up through the wall and then hung a retractable air hose reel within my garage. So now I have all my pneumatic tools up there, can work on the cars and all that good stuff without having to drag a 20 gallon tank up from the basement. So those are really cool. And then I was at Home Depot on the date night with the wife and uh, she let me pick up a 20 volt DeWalt weed eater. So it's a cordless, no, so no gasoline. It just uses the battery pack that the rest of my tools use. So uh, it's really cool. It's fun. And it's powerful. So yay, power tools. If your wife lets you take her on a date to Home Depot, she is a key. <laughs> <laughs> that is all I have to say about that. <laughs> All right, David, what are your picks? Today, I've got the response to my bad, my bad blog article, which was a book I found. It's called uh, Making Learning um, Whole by David Perkins. And it's just this idea of jumping in to the core stuff to play the whole game. So they, they, he uses uh, baseball uh, uh, analogy throughout the book of this is how you learn things like baseball, you pick up a bat, you take a swing and you get involved. And, um, and, and, and so writing that way, learning that way. Um, uh, so I've been working through that book um, already and I'm loving it. It's very well written. Uh, so making learning whole. And then the follow-up on the, my back burner is another book that's very similar, Soft Skills, the Software Developer's Life Manual. Same idea, you know, take, take a look at what it is I'm, I'm learning and break it down in a way that I can jump into the real stuff and play with it and build a practice. So they're both two books on the same topic, um, Soft Skills of Software Developers Life Manual by um, John Sonmez and um, Making Learning Whole by David Perkins. We should get John Sonmez on the show. That'd be amazing. That'd be wonderful. He's a good friend of mine. So we'll see if we line that up. I'm going to jump in here with a few picks. Um, I've been listening to audiobooks a lot. Lately, um, I, I listen to Audible quite a bit. If you want to get a free audiobook from Audible, you can actually uh, go to devchat.tv slash Audible, and we get a little cut of that, which is nice. But uh, either way, I mean, the audiobooks are nice because driving kids to school and things like that, which I only have to do for a few more days. Um, uh, it's, it's just terrific. So I just barely listened to a couple of books that I want to pick. Um, I've, been, I've been trying to figure out how to deal with some of the things that my, you know, my kids are going through. Um, and one of the books that I picked up was the five love languages of children. Um, now a lot of people are familiar with the five love languages book. Um, I think it's by Gary Chapman. I'll have to double check on the name. It's something close to that if that's not it, but, um, he has the five love languages for children and he talks about how you essentially, he, he uses the metaphor of the love tank and how you keep your kids love tank full. And I've been thinking about it and I realized that uh, 
I've been doing some things wrong with some of my kids. So if you're looking for some, uh, some parenting advice and at the end of the book, he talks about, you know, well, what if, what if you're a single parent or, you know, things like that, um, you know, or you're, you're divorced and you have, you know, your kid lives with you or doesn't live with you or any of that. Anyway, he talks about some of that too. And just some of the ways that you can, um, still, you know, work with your kids and, and fill their love tank. Um, but most of the book, he just, you know, he assumes that you're a parent who cares about your kid and gives you strategies and, um, you know, and then, yeah, he addresses the other stuff because it changes the dynamic a little bit, but I, I really, really like the book. Um, and so I'm going to recommend it. Um, I've also been listening to another book called the whole brain child. Um, and this one's by Daniel J Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. And, uh, it's, it's really, really interesting too. talks about, uh, the different ways that you can stimulate your kids to, um, think, learn and behave in different ways and, um, you know, kind of bring them around so that they become well-rounded people and well-adjusted people. And, uh, anyway, the, the two books have kind of got me thinking about a lot of things with my kids. It's, it's changed my approach on some things. So anyway, really, really enjoying those books. Pavel, what are your picks? Well, uh, I picked my lastest, uh, Ruby gem. It's called chart table. It's about displaying uh, charts in the Ruby on Rails app. Uh, I used to think that it's really hard. I don't want to mess with the old JavaScript things. And I just decided to build a simple gem that helps you to generate the data you need. And then you can just easily display the beautiful charts on the front end using some of the gems for generating charts. Uh, and I think it's really great. I also think that the soft skills book is really great. Uh, I agree with uh, David. After reading these books, uh, this book, I realized that I need to build my personal brand and I started to build my blog. So huge thanks to the John for writing this piece of art, I think. Yeah, every developer should, should read it. It's a game nice. changer for me. <laughs> nice. All right. So one other thing that I want to quickly let you shout out about is how people find you online. And first of all, I, for, for uh, GitHub, I just, I think it's awesome that you got Ruby hero as your <laughs> GitHub handle. Um, where are you on Twitter? And then um, can you give us the URL for your blog again? Uh, yes, of course. So on Twitter, um, under nickname P Dabrowski uh, floor K one. Uh, it's really long nickname, but I will, uh, paste it here. And my blog is under the address pdabrowski.com slash blog. And it's soon, it will be also available on the main website, but I need to finish my uh, Ruby engine and it, it will be ready then. And awesome. I'm also on the GitHub. I'm not yet on the YouTube, but I will be soon, I think. Very cool. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Thanks for coming, Pavel. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. It was a great ins experience for me. And I'm looking forward to see you again in the future. All right. Yeah. We'll wrap this one up. We'll catch everyone next week. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. 